Amen. Thank you, Josh and Casey. That was um, holy, holy, holy. We're going to talk about that a little later. So we are in the book of Ezra. And just real quick, um, Ezra is kind of like this with Nehemiah. It covers a lot of the same people, a lot of the same events. Um, overlap some in the timeline there. Yeah, if you want to pass those out, that would be great. Um, so we're going to cover Ezra tonight, and next week will be Nehemiah. And so you're going to hear about some familiar happenings with the two. Now, I wanted to start out tonight with a timeline that Josh and Jonathan are passing out right now. And it's actually the first slide. Um, yeah, it's kind of hard to see up there. And one of the reasons I wanted to start with this is up to this point, the Bible has been fairly chronological. Does, any, does everybody know what chronological means? It, the story is arranged in the order of events as they happen, and, and the books of the Bible are pretty much arranged in the order that they happen pretty well up to this point. Um, we have seen where there's first and second kings, and first and second chronicles kind of uh, recap a lot of that, and second chronicles goes a little beyond second kings, and second chronicles does take us, I mean, right up to the book of Ezra. But from this point on, after Nehemiah and Esther, it gets really weird as far as the chronology goes. Like in a few weeks, we're going to be in Job, which is, if you look, is all the way back in Genesis, um, way back there. Um, and tonight, we're going to look forward in our Bible and able to look, to, to look back at things that happened before Ezra. And one of the, one of the things I, I want you to see in this is I, I want you to see, we want you to see individual stories, but we also want you to see a story arc. And understanding where you are on that story arc can help you in piecing together the whole story. Um, so last time um, I taught on judges and I talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, how movie makers will take movie theme music, like the main theme, and they will loop it at, at points in time throughout the movie, at strategic times throughout the movie, in order to draw you into a story. You don't even realize it's happening when you're watching a movie. Um, but they do this intentionally on purpose to, to draw you into these certain points in the story arc. And then that music will, will build and, and fall and build and fall. And then at the main point where all of it has been pointing to the, the main um, time that the hero does his thing, it builds to a crescendo. And so in much the same way, that's what we're doing in this road to Emmaus is we're showing you where that main theme is looped in the Old Testament in order to draw you into a story. And a lot of what we're looking at are what we call types and shadows. Types of Christ, um, shadows of Christ, things that are all pointing to Christ. But one thing I want you to see in the, the timeline here is that we're at the Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther are really some of the last narrative in the Old Testament. And so if you see um, on your timeline, you have the end of the Old Testament, and it's still, I think, 400 B.C. there. And then it's called the 400 silent years. And so... I want you to see where these are more than just shadows and types here. The, we're, we're four to 500 or 450, 550 years before Christ comes. And all of the, all the pieces have to be brought into place for him to be and do what he was to be and do. And so that's one reason I wanted you to kind of see where we are 
in the story arc. In a sense, the, the main theme is going to swell this one last time in Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. And then it will die away, complete silence for 400 years until Christ is born. And then it will build to its, its finale, its, its crescendo, its pinnacle, its peak with the person and work of Jesus Christ. So I want to show you a couple of just things I'm talking about. Like in Isaiah 9, 1 and 2, it says uh, that Jesus' ministry would be in Galilee. Well, most all of the Jews are in exile in Babylon at this point. That's where we are in the story right now is they're all in, most all of them in Babylon. They're not in Galilee. And so unless Jesus wanted to minister as a botanist or a veterinarian to the plants and the animals, and I don't think he was as interested in that as people, um, there have to be people in Galilee for him to minister to, right? Um, so the people have to be brought from exile back in order for that prophecy about Christ to come true. Uh, Zechariah 9.9 9 says that Jesus would ride into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey. Well, right now in the story, there is no city of Jerusalem. It's rubble. And so the city has to be rebuilt in order for him to ride into. Psalm 69.9 says, Zeal for your house has consumed me. What was David in the Psalms talking about when he said, Your house? What was he talking about? Anybody know? The temple. The temple, yes. Zeal for your house, your temple, has consumed me. And that was a prophecy that, that Christ would fulfill. You all remember when he made the whip and drove out the money changers? And his disciples remembered that David said, Zeal for your house has consumed me. At this point in the story, there is no temple. The temple is rubble. Nebuchadnezzar came in um, 50 years prior to this and leveled the temple. So in order for those things to happen, all these pieces at some point have to come into place. And we have the luxury of being able to look back and see it all unfold. They didn't know exactly what was going to happen next. They knew some things if they trusted the Lord, and we're going to see that in a few minutes, that the Lord had told them very specific things. So here's what we're going to do tonight. Y'all are going to read. Um, I don't have a study guide, and I'm not going to put verses up here for y'all to read. Y'all are going to stay in the book of Ezra. I want y'all to camp in the book of Ezra, and y'all are going to read all the verses that we read tonight from Ezra, and I'm going to read the other verses so that y'all don't have to be flipping around as much, and y'all can kind of Maybe get a little, little more familiar and digging into Ezra. So if y'all could open your Bibles um, to the book of Ezra, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, it's in there. And if somebody could look up uh, Ezra 1.1 1, 1 and just read that first verse for me. Okay. Go for it. All right, <clears throat> so did you hear the part in there where it said that the word of the Lord according to the prophet of Jeremiah might be fulfilled? Well, this is written in such a way that, that we're expected to know what Jeremiah said. It's almost like when you're reading a, like a Wikipedia article or something and, and it has an event that it references and you're supposed to know what it is and it, the, the event will actually be a link that you can click on and go and see what that event was so you can know what it's talking about in the story. Well, we're going to click on that link and go to Jeremiah 29.10. I'll go there. You can stay in Ezra. And he says a lot, but this is just the, the portion we're really going to key in on. Jeremiah 29.10, For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are complete for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. So there's going to be 70 years of exile in Babylon. 
that King Nebuchadnezzar overthrew the city of Jerusalem and took, um, took its people, most all of its people out and exiled them and took them and they were slaves in Babylon for 70 years. And he promised at some point in there, Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, prophesied from the word of the Lord that they would be delivered after 70 years. And so Ezra starts out, that 70 years is up. And so things are about to happen. So if somebody could read um, verses 2 through 5, go for it. All right, so we have um, God has moved uh, King Cyrus, um, and I got to throw this in here. I wasn't going to do it. I got to because it's fun. Um, if you look on your timeline, where is Isaiah in this timeline? It's, it's well before these events, right? Okay, Isaiah actually prophesied. It was around 150 years before Isaiah prophesied by name, called Cyrus by name. God, you know, revealed this to him. Said Cyrus is going to um, be this king. I'm going to give him victory over all these people, and he's going to do all these things. Um, <clears throat> and some people believe if you look where Daniel is in the timeline, there, uh, some people believe historians like Josephus think, and this is not for sure, but they think that maybe. Daniel even showed King Cyrus in Babylon the prophecy concerning himself. Can you imagine that? Somebody comes up to you and says, Hey, um, uh, Yahweh, our, the God of Israel, he, he called you by name here and said you were going to do all these things. And Cyrus did every one of them. And so that's just an interesting thing there. It's, we don't know for sure if Daniel did that, um, but it's... I think it's pretty likely, given the timeline, and, and Daniel would have known uh, that scripture. Um, so you have Cyrus. He was, a, he was a pagan king, but he was a good benevolent king, um, and he did pretty, pretty well by Israel here. He, he freed them from their exile and, and even helped them out. Um, he, he sent them visions and, and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> it also says this. Um, um, most versions say, the Lord stirred the heart of King Cyrus. So, let me ask you this. Is this how God operates with prophecy? Like even with King Cyrus. Did God look down over and say, oh, because he has like a crystal ball and he can see down through time and he says, oh, there's going to be a King Cyrus. Oh, and he, he, oh, look, do this. I'm going to write this down. Okay, okay, Isaiah, say, say, say Cyrus is going to do this. Is that how God is sovereign? Is that how prophecy works? No. See, and this tells us right here that God stirred his heart. God was active. Yes, God knew way beforehand because God knew he was going to make it happen. He was going to stir his heart to bring about these events. It also says that later, I think verse uh, 3 or 4, it says that he stirred the hearts of the people to return to Jerusalem. Now, not everybody went back. Some of the people stayed in Babylon. And we're going to see later in the story when Ezra comes in, it's actually the second wave, and even then some people stayed in Babylon. 
And it's not that the, the good ones went back to Jerusalem and the bad ones stay in Babylon, or there you can make some argument that there may have been a little bit of that going on. Some of the people may have been a little too comfortable in uh, Babylon. But I think God, either way, either way, God had a purpose for the ones that would stay in Babylon. He had a story to tell there through those people uniquely that could only be told in Babylon. Like we'll hear in um, a couple of weeks, the story of Esther. See, that happened somewhere in like chapter 6 and 7 of Ezra. And God, God wanted that, God had already planned that and, and wanted Esther and Mordecai and all them to be there. And so God was sovereignly working in those stories. Also this, I think they would have needed their hearts to be stirred to make this journey. Can we go to the next slide? This is a map of, um, I think this one's actually showing their, their route to exile to Bab Babylon, but it, it would have been pretty similar coming back. <clears throat> Around 900 to 1,000 miles. See, you couldn't make a straight shot. You'd be going through desert half, half the time, and you would all die, more than likely. <clears throat> you had to go up and stay along more the Fertile Crescent, rivers, and all of that so that you could have water, so that you could have food. Um, and so this is around somewhere around 1,000 miles, 900,000 miles where they would go. And this is around, the first wave was around 50,000 people on foot, through treacherous, dangerous roads and places. Um, this was not um, all healthy men and women in their 20s and 30s. This would have been elderly. We'll see later. It would have been some people at least in their 60s because some of them <clears throat> remembered the first temple, which was destroyed at least 50 years before this. Um, I'm sure families with kids and infants and all that. I did a little math, and it says it, the second wave, it says it took them four months to get there. So if you divide about 1,000-ish miles into four months, that's eight miles a day for four months on foot, carrying everything you have with you. Maybe they had some camels and, and this and that. I, I don't know. They, they didn't have a military escort. At least when they were being brought into exile from Judah to Babylon, it would have been a forced march, but at least they would have had an army with them. At least they would have kept them from starving and probably driven off band bandits or whoever from uh, killing them and, and stealing what they had. On the way back, they didn't have that. So they very well needed their hearts to be stirred to make that journey. All right, uh, Ezra 3, 1 through 3. Who's got that? Then the seventh month came, and the sons of Israel were in the cities, and the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Then Jeshua, the son of Josedek, and his brothers, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brothers arose and built the altar of the God of Israel, offered burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So they set up the altar on its foundation, for they were terrified because of the peoples of the lands, and they offered burnt offerings on it to Yahweh. Burnt offerings, morning and evening. All right, so they arrive and they rebuild the altar, which is all they really need to reinstitute um, the, the most basic of their worship, which was sacrifice. Um, and the fact that they made it there was reason enough to call for worship to the Lord, that they had made it those thousand miles, 50,000 people. Um, that they had made it there, and that God once again had shown Himself faithful to His Word, 
faithful that he said, after this, I'm bringing you back. I'm going to raise up this pagan king. He's going to set you free, and you're going to come back. So that would have been cause enough to worship the Lord. Uh, Ezra 3, 8. Aiden, go for it. All right, so restoration, rebuilding the temple begins. And you heard the name Zerubbabel. Um, Until Ezra shows up, Zerubbabel is kind of the main guy, one of the main guys in the story. Um, And this is one of the main objectives that they've been sent there to do is to rebuild the temple, rebuild the city. And so they begin uh, Ezra 3, 10 through 12. Who's got that? Go ahead, Emma. Read it loud. Asa? Was that it? Asa. All right, so they, the foundation of the temple has been laid. And then the, this strange thing happens. The young men are rejoicing and shouting. And it says the old men, the heads of fathers' houses, who had seen the first temple. Who built that first temple? Solomon. Solomon. Yes, this was at, and Solomon's temple was at the height of the glory of, of the kingdom of Israel. And it would have been a magnificent building to see, no doubt. And they see that this one is not near to that level. But do you think that's the only reason they're weeping? Would they really weep just because the building is not as big? Was there something else missing from this temple? What was missing? What's that? The ark. The ark ark of the covenant. Nebuchadnezzar had taken the ark. And the ark was gone after this. The, The ark is never recovered after this, which I think is interesting. Along with the ark of the covenant, what did the ark represent in the temple? God's presence. The glory of the Lord. And the glory of the Lord never filled this temple. The glory of the Lord never filled Herod's temple, which was the, the temple built um, around just before Christ, or really right around uh, the time of Christ. That would have been the third temple, is Herod's temple. This is the second temple. The glory of the Lord never filled it. Now, Haggai, who was um, in Israel during that time, he he addressed this and talked to um, specifically even these old men. And I'll read this, Haggai 2, 1 through 9. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, 
and to Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it, as, is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. And listen to this. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. So he's saying... Don't look back. You're weeping because you're looking back. Don't look back. Look for Herod's temple. Would Herod's temple be and filled with more glory? No, I already said that the glory of God never filled that temple either, in a sense. Let's look at John, or I will read to you John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. But before I do, I want to talk about, uh, Tim Evans said this a few months ago, and I think it's, it's helpful in understanding prophecy, that the prophets often, it, when, when they would prophesy, it was almost like looking at a mountain range where you had a, a nearer peak of a mountain, and then it would dip down, and then you would have behind it a little higher peak that you can see, and then it would dip down, and then an even maybe a, a, a finally... Um, peak that you can see that's the highest one of all. And as prophets would prophesy, there sometimes would be a, a near fulfillment and, and then an ultimate fulfillment. And so we're going to look at the, the things that Haggai um, could have been talking about. One is uh, Jesus in John chapter 2. After he's cleansed the temple, it says this. He, he's just driven people out of the temple with a whip. Which even that right there, you could make a, some theologians make a case for, well, Jesus was in the temple, and so it was filled with far greater glory than this temple was. And that there may be something to say about this, but listen to what Jesus' words are. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple. And you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So I believe that one of those mountain peaks that Isaiah was, was seeing from afar of this more glorious temple would have been the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, <clears throat> and then we have in Ephesians 2, 19 through 20, listen to this. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the, the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is that the church, us, believers, that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. This should make us sing for joy and tremble in fear. If you would have asked any one of those Jews before the new covenant and said, hey, we're going to take what's in the holy of holies and we're going to put it inside of you, they would have ran in terror. They no doubt would have thought of Uzzah, 
the man who, as the Ark of the Covenant, which represented God's presence, inadvertently or in the wrong way, touched the Ark and God struck him dead right there. And I think, you want to put that inside of me? Do you want to kill me? We should be amazed at the fact that true followers of Christ are indwelt by God Himself. And I love that we sing holy, 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 because that holy, holy, holy God, it should amaze us that He would want to take up residence inside of us. So what has to happen in order for God to take up residence in a place? Where did the ark go in the temple? It go up just wherever, throw it in a corner, outside. The holy of holies. Yes. We have to be made holy. We have to be made clean. Can we make ourselves clean enough on our own? No. Our righteousness is like what? Filthy rags, says Isaiah. One more question. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Isaiah says, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be washed whiter than snow. And I think there, this, some people may think I'm stretching this a little far, but I think there may be a picture of this in um, Ezra, if, turn to chapter 6 and read verses 15 through 17. Who can read that for me? Isaiah, or uh, Ezra 6. 15 through 17. And this house was finished on the very day of the month of Advent, in the sixth year of the, of the reign of their king. Is that 15 through 17? Yeah. And the people of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the returned exiles celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. They offered at the dedication of this house of God 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs. And as a sin offering of all Israel, 12 milgos, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. All right, did y'all catch that? Around seven, this is at the dedication of the temple. More than, when it's 700, there's 400 lambs and 200 and then 100. So that's over seven, and then 12 for all the tribes. That's over 700 large animals that are sacrificed to dedicate the temple. I want you to think about that. Think, you know, this would have been a pretty good sized building and there were a good many people there. Think about 700 animals being killed basically as fast as they could process them and kill them. That would be a gory bloodbath. I'm not going to be dogmatic about it and say this is the only thing it represents or this is absolutely what it represents, but it absolutely is a, can be a picture of to make this temple a dwelling place for God, a once and for all huge sacrifice had to be made. And for us, that was who? Jesus on the cross. Do you feel the weight of that? And see, I, I, I want to put that picture in mind. For them, it's the picture that was given. 700 animals killed. This bloodbath on account of their sin so that they can be cleansed, so that they can be made holy. This should make us sing for joy and tremble with fear. It should also drive us to holiness. As it says in um, 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought at a price. So glorify God in your, own, in your body. So I think this, this was another mountain peak of a more glorious temple to come that, that Haggai would have seen from afar. And I believe there's an ultimate fulfillment and that is Revelation 21, 22 through 26. And this is the eternal state. This is after it's all said and done, and we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. 
And I saw no temple in the city. You say, no temple. And he says this, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. That even, even the rendering of it sounds a lot like what Haggai said in his pro- prophecy. So now we have, moving on, we have Ezra's arrival. Better late than never. The book was written by him, by the way, and it bears his name, and he doesn't show up until chapter 7. What a slacker. So let's turn to Ezra 7, and if somebody can read uh, verses 6 through 10. Uh, ten. For on the first day of the month he began to go from Babylonia, and the first day of the fifth month he came to Jerusalem, for the good hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach his statutes and the rules of Israel. All right. So Ezra was a scribe, <clears throat> a scribe priest, but a scribe was one that knew the law, copied the law, like transcribed, you know, wrote um, copies of the law and the word of God. Um, And they taught the law. And they also had kind of uh, almost what we would call civic duties because um, the law of the land was the law of the Old Testament in that time. And so people would go to them. Not everybody had a copy of the law. Not everybody had the latest version of the iPhone in those days. And so they would go to the scribe if there's any question they had about the law, dispute about the law, or things like that. And it says that he was skill, a skilled scribe in the law of Moses, that he prepared his heart to seek the law, to do it, and to teach it. So Ezra was a type of Christ in this way, kind of that the blessed man that Psalms 1 talks about, that Jesus was the ultimate fulfillment of, that his delight would be in the law of the Lord, and in his law he would meditate day and night. So not perfectly, but Ezra was a type of Christ in that he loved, did, and taught the law of the Lord. So I want to give you some compare and contrast here with Ezra and Christ and and kind of tease out a little bit. So Ezra copied the word of the Lord. Jesus was the word made flesh. Um, And if you even tease that out a little more, you have Ezra taught the law. The law, you could say, was kind of an extension of God's character. The law tells us something, not everything by any means, It tells us something of who God is. Jesus, in the New Testament, says that He was the exact imprint of the Father's nature. He tells us all that we need to know about who God is and who the Father is. Ezra taught the law. Jesus fulfilled the law. So there's some compare and contrast Um, uh, shadows and types of Ezra and Jesus. So now we're going to get to one of the strangest portions in Scripture, uh, Ezra chapter 9. If someone could uh, turn to Ezra chapter 9 and read the first seven verses. Aiden, go ahead.
thanks. That was a tough passage. You did good on that. So recap what he just read. Ezra gets back and he realizes that they have taken many, many, many of the people have taken foreign wives. Now, what was the significance of that? Why, why were they not supposed to take foreign wives? No, go ahead. And why did he tell them not to? Lead them astray into what? Other gods, idol worship. This is one of the reasons, or the main reason, that they were exiled. And he's just gotten back. And they're doing it again. There's a lot of pictures like this. Like when Moses came off the Mount Sinai, and he, know, he got to the bottom of the mountain, and they had already broken the covenant. And I think that's why he took the commandments and he broke them, signifying, you've already broke your end of the deal. Praise the Lord that he is faithful. Going back to that covenant that he struck with Abraham and said, I'm going through this alone because I'm the only one that can hold up both ends of this deal. And here they are again. They've broken the covenant Again, they've, they're, they're walking in disobedience, disobeying, doing the things that they're not supposed to do. All right, so let's look at um, ver, uh, chapter 10, <clears throat> verses 1 through 3. Go ahead. Okay, so did y'all catch what was said there? All these people, a bunch of people that have married foreign wives, a charge is being given for them to put away these wives, to divorce them. Okay, and I said when we started down this passage, this is a strange part of Scripture. Okay, one, some practical thoughts on this. Um, this is not normal. Even for the Old Testament, this is not normal. There's no other passage like this where there's a mass divorce. Um, if you've been on Sunday mornings in Acts, you've heard this a lot. It's descriptive, not prescriptive. Okay, it's, In other words, it's describing what is happening. It's not telling us what we should do. Okay, um, The New Testament equivalent of this, maybe you could say, would like be being married to an unbeliever. And Paul is, um, although the Bible states clearly that marrying an unbeliever is wrong, Paul also clearly states in Corinthians that if you are married to an unbeliever, you are to stay married to that believer as long as it's up to you, as long as, um, as, as you hold, uphold your end of the deal. Um, and a Practical note on that as well, and this is not what the lesson's about. I've just got to, got to say this. To please use wisdom and seeking wisdom from the Lord in seeking who you're going to marry or not marry. That you ask the Lord for wisdom in discerning, um, is this person a believer? 
Is there fruit in their lives? Do they love the Lord? Because marriage is a huge commitment. Um, so, verses 10, or chapter 10, 11, and 12. I'll get this real quick. Now then, make confession to the Lord, the God of your fathers, and do his will. Separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the foreign wives. Then all the assembly answered with a loud voice, It is so, we must do as you have said. They confess and they repent of their sin. And I, of all the things that you can draw from this, and there's a lot to be drawn, but I do think repentance, this is a very good picture of repentance. Because repentance is not just saying you're sorry, right? What is repentance? Turning, turning away, turning from sin. You're putting, you're, you're removing yourself from the sin because you're from the And so they put away these wives. I think there could be um, some, some thoughts in this that the Bible talks about not making any provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. And that's basically what these wives were. They knew it would be a snare to them. If they stayed with these wives, it would be a temptation and a snare for them. And so they removed that. So I do think it's a good um, example of repentance. And I want to look at, um, at Ezra's prayer here as we finish up, lastly. In uh, chapter 9, verse 8, Ezra prays this, But now for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and give us a secure hold within His holy place that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us, listen to this, a little reviving in our slavery. A little reviving in our slavery. It seems that this prayer is very forward-looking. Unless Ezra just wanted to settle for just a little reviving in their slavery. Because with all of their efforts to bring about religious reform, it fell short. It fell vastly short. And even though everything Ezra did was to be looked at as a good example and commended, he could not ultimately be what Israel needed for him to be. Christ would bring about freedom from our slavery to sin. He would bring about more than revival. He would bring about regeneration. We would be raised up in Jesus out of our deadness of sin. Jesus is the true and greater Ezra, the true and greater scribe, who would not only teach and love the law, but would fulfill it, would not only copy the word, but be the word made flesh. Points to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we thank you so much <clears throat> for this incredible story that you have woven over thousands of years. Lord, we thank you so much that as we read earlier, that we, we who once were far off can be brought near by the blood of Christ, that we can be a part of this story, a part of what you are doing through what Christ has done. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to who he is and what he's done, that we would indeed be drawn near by the blood of Christ. Lord, I pray that our hearts would burn within us to see Jesus, to know Jesus, and to live for Jesus. We thank you and praise you for all that you've done, and we pray this in his strong name. Amen.